how to affect other people with words. Of all the things I've tried to work on all these years in the personal development field, this has been it, how to communicate well. It has so much to do with the money you earn, with your relationship with your family. It has so much to do with, you know, your value to the marketplace, being able to exchange ideas, get your ideas across, communicate with people, you know, from all walks of life, especially in your field of endeavor. And then all of the other areas, spiritual, social, personal, family, at home, and the things I'm going to cover, hopefully you'll find useful in fine-tuning your ability to touch people with words. So let's start off with this phrase, words have the ability to work miracles. Words have the ability to work miracles. So now let me give you my definition of a miracle. A miracle is simply something we don't quite understand how it works. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means we don't quite understand how it works. So we tend to call it a miracle. But words have that incredible ability to potentially work miracles. First is the miracle of food. Words provide food. Words become bread. Words give life. The other miracle is the miracle of light, creating sight. Because there's two ways to see. One is with your eyes and the other is with your mind, your consciousness. And words have the ability to create light so that you can see. I said to my Israeli audience last summer, you know, the story of creation is unique. It says, in the beginning, Jehovah spoke and said, let there be light. And there was light. Looks like words create light. Someone says, well, yes, maybe God's words, but humans can get pretty close. What if somebody can't see how they can possibly be successful and you come along and tell them your story, choosing the best words you possibly can? And when you finish, they say, now I can see. Before I got here, I was blind. Now that you've talked to me, I can see. The lights are going on. Before you got here, I was in the dark. In fact, while you were talking, some things dawned on me. Wow, the sun started coming up. Are words that powerful? And the answer is yes. Words are so powerful to create sight, to create image, to create vision. Uh, your words are valuable in creating sight, not only for yourself to see the future, but especially for your family and the people around you that are within the scope of your own influence. Words are powerful in framing ideas. Words are powerful in launching institutions. America's Declaration of Independence that launched the country. I'm telling you, the founders who wrote the Declaration of Independence signed it like this, to this document, setting out the vision of a new country and its potential. We pledge our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. Can words become that powerful that a collection of words put into a document would cause those who wrote those words to sign it, pledging lives and fortunes and sacred honor? And the answer is yes. Words are that powerful. The words of the Christian story formulated 2,000 years ago have lasted for 2,000 years and affected the world like no other idea. Words framed, words chosen, words fit together to create not only bread so that we can nourish ourselves, but also can create light and sight. So I want to do my best. Words are clumsy sometimes at best when we try to describe what's going on in our head, let alone our heart. But I'm going to do my best, especially dealing with this subject, communication, how to affect other people with words. So let's get started. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. <laughs> I'd like to go with all of you wherever you're going because uh, I think unbelievable things are going to happen when you get wherever you're going. Too bad I can't go, right, a thousand different directions after we leave here. Anyway, whoever you're going to touch in the last 30 days hasn't got a chance, I'm telling you. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Let's talk first about steps to good communication. I got four simple steps to communicate well. All of my stuff is easy to follow, threes and fours and fives. I don't go much beyond that. 
Yes, I did do a book with seven. That really stretched me. Seven. <laughs> seven strategies for wealth and happiness. But here's four. Four steps to achieving good communication. This is simple, easy stuff. I mentioned it yesterday, but if you didn't write it down, write it down today. Success is simply a refined study of the obvious. A refined study of the obvious. And if we just, you know, deal with the obvious in a refined way so that, number one, we understand it better, number two, we learn how to apply it better to all the systems of our life so that they work well, create equities for us, simple, basic, you know, easy stuff. So the four steps to achieve good communication. Here's number one, have something good to say. That's fairly obvious. If you want to communicate, you've got to have something. You cannot speak that which you do not know. You can't deliver what you don't already possess. Right? You can't transmit, you know, from an empty carton, from an empty locality. You know, you've got to have something before you can transmit something. So first of all, you got to have something. The key word here is preparation. Preparing to speak well in the future, to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. Preparation. Now, there's two parts to preparation. One is with purpose. Why would you like to communicate well? How is it going to serve you? What is the purpose of your studying communication and getting good at it? What full range of accomplishments are are you going for, and you're going to use good communication and all that full range of accomplishments. See, that's first of all. You've got to say, here's why I want to be able to speak well and talk well and master my language, master the vocabulary. If you've got enough reasons, see, you can do the most extraordinary things. We do not lack the ability nor the capacity to do extraordinary things. But sometimes what we do lack is sufficient power to make us go do the disciplines, to do the studies, to become gifted. And if you've got strong enough reasons, I'm, you can learn to do anything if you've got strong enough reasons. And then all of the how and the ways and means are all available. What if you had to be rich? What if you had no choice? To sponsor all the things you wanted to sponsor and to support your family in the manner in which you wanted to support them, to do the things you wanted to do the rest of your life around the world, what if you had to be rich? The question is, well, are there books on the subject? Are there books that teach how to become wealthy? And the answer is yes, there's plenty of books on how to be rich. But if you don't have to be rich, then why bother to read the books? I mean, save yourself the strain. <laughs> but see, if you have to, we can do the most extraordinary things if we have to. If I said to you, we're going to duplicate this weekend, next weekend, and uh, I'm going to ask all of you to help, but the tab for next weekend is going to go sky high. It's going to cost $5,000 for the weekend. But we're going to teach how to build a corporation, you know, and a lot of other subjects. And for each person that gets 20 people to come to this weekend, I've got a cashier's check waiting for you for $50,000. How many of you could get the folks here? <laughs> See, it, it's easy. Then I would say, now I'm going to do some training the next couple of days on how to get those people to my seminar next weekend, you would say, forget the training. Just make sure the check is good. <laughs> we, we don't need much training. See, all of us almost say, make it worth my while and see what I can do. All, all of us, I'm, I'm telling you, would say that. Just make it worth my while, and I can do the most extraordinary things if you make it worth my while. But now here's the big challenge. you got to make it worth your own while. You're the one that's got to come up with those visions and incentives and reasons and power. So the first key to good communication is, what are you going to use it for? I mean, there's no use putting yourself through the studies, you know, and learn the extra vocabulary and all the stuff if you haven't got some good, powerful, strong enough reasons to put yourself through the paces. But if you've got powerful enough reasons why you want to communicate, I'm telling you, everybody here has got the capacity to develop the skills. So... Preparation with purpose. Now, here's the second one. Preparation on purpose. Every day preparing. Deliberately preparing. Conscientiously preparing. Not haphazardly. Not spasmodically. But deliberately. Conscientiously. Consistently. So, with purpose and on purpose. I wish to get ready 
to be able to speak well so that I can be productive in a variety of areas of my life and create those equities that I'm searching for. I'm telling you that's all possible if you look at it this way. Now preparing is laborious, I understand that. And for humans it takes a while to prepare. Human beings takes longer to develop than any other life form. Oh, the little wildebeest, when it's born in Africa, I'm telling you, it's only got a few minutes. And as soon as it's born, mother tries to get it to stand up, and it stands up, and it wobbles around, falls back down, stands up, falls back down. The mother keeps nudging it, stand up, stand up. You've got to get these legs strong. Come on, come on, come on. Now the little wildebeest is hungry and wants to nurse. And mother pushes it away and says, no, we haven't got time for that now. The lion's got to get these legs strong. Within less than an hour, the little wildebeest is able to run with the herd. Less than an hour. And escape the lions and have a potential future. Uh, human babies take a little longer. <laughs> you know, after 17 years, we're not sure. <laughs> They're ready to run with the herd, escape the lions. It seems like it takes so long, that first three years, that first five years, that first seven, eight, nine years. Finally, we get into the teens, and finally, gosh, we got a few more years. But then, finally, when that foundation is laid and the preparation is made, then the acceleration can be astronomical. And all of us admire those that have just taken off like a rocket once. The foundation finally reached a certain point where it caught fire. And that's what this is all about. First, you've got to just do it laboriously. You've got to just do it deliberately. Day after day, a little more preparation. This week, a little better than last week. This year, a little better than last year. Then finally, it starts to take off. That's the key here, preparation. Now, let me give you four words that will help you to prepare. Here's the first one, interest. I'm asking you, especially this audience, the best of the best, the cream of the crop, I'm asking you to accelerate if you can, especially the next five years getting ready for the turn of the century. Accelerate your interest in everything. Your interest in politics, your interest in government, your interest in life, your interest in, your interest in the major life questions, the major political issues, the major social challenges of the day. I'm asking you to take a new interest, a more sharpened interest, a more keen interest in everything. Two major subjects to study the rest of your life, and that's life and people. People in all of their aspects, and life in all of its aspects. Be a better student this year than last year. Be a better student the next five versus the last five. Uh, take an interest in what's going on around you. Take an interest in what's going on on the other side of the world. We are now affected not just by our neighbors. We are now affected by what goes on on the other side of the world. We're affected nation to nation. We're affected industry to industry. Uh, we're affected, you know, year to year from everything that goes on around the globe. So be interested in it. Be interested in banks and money and government and society. Be interested in free enterprise. You know, be interested in all of the complicated issues, not just the easy ones, the complicated ones. Or what are we going to do about creating a better vision for our young people? I'm asking you to be interested in the full menu of the subjects that deal with human nature and government, and politics, and industry, and company, and corporation, and future. Don't let yourself get lazy here in becoming a better student. So capitalize on your interest. Here's number two word, and that is fascination, which goes that step beyond interest. Interested people want to know, does it work? Fascinated people want to know what? How does it work? Below the surface, here's what I see. My interest tells me here's what I see. But my fascination tells me what's going on that I can't see. That's why kids learn so much that first six, seven years. They're fascinated. They're curious. they got to know. The sign says no one under 21 years of age allowed. Kid says, what's going on behind there? Kids are studying, you know, things we ignore. Kids are studying the ants. Adults are walking on them. Kids, they don't walk on these ants. I'm studying them. <laughs> How come an ant can carry something bigger than he is? I mean, kids' minds are just zinging all the time. Curiosity, that's how come they amass such a piece of the language and a, a piece of foundation that'll last them the rest of their lives that first six, seven years. I'm telling you, curiosity. So here's what I'm asking you to do. 
reawaken your childish curiosity, reawaken your fascination with life and all of its aspects. And here's another little trick I've learned, and that is to turn frustration into fascination. It's just a little trick of the mind, but anybody can do it, practice it. You get a lot more from an occasion if you're fascinated versus frustrated. Even when I'm tempted to be frustrated, I'm fascinated with my own frustration. <laughs> How come it doesn't take me long to lose my cool? It must be from my father's side. My mother was gentle. Anyway, number one is interest. Number two is fascination. Here's number three. This is an important one. Sensitivity. If you want to communicate well, you've got to have this experience, sensitivity, in touch with people and their feelings, both their tragedy and their triumph the full range of human experience. You've got to be in touch with that. Sensitivity to where people might be at the moment, sensitivity to a person's background, sensitivity to why a person might act as they do at the moment, sensitivity, trying to see it from someone else's point of view, trying to walk, as the ancient proverb said, in someone else's shoes for a while, empathy, seeing if you can't understand, even though you don't have the experience, you've got to try. If you want to communicate with the full range of possibilities out there, you've got to try to understand the full menu of human experience to the best of your ability. Now, you can't really know unless you live it, but let's, let me tell you what you can do. You can try. Me, I've never had any tragedy in my life. What do I know about tragedy? I was an only child. My parents spoiled me. I met Shof when I was 25, was a millionaire by age 31. Did go broke and had to start over, but you know, what else is new? It was no tragedy. So I don't know tragedy. I've never lost one of my children, as some of those did so tragically in Oklahoma City. I don't know what that's like. I don't know tragedy. So what I tried to do back in those early days when I lived in Northern California, I used to go to San Francisco two, three, four times a year on a special day called my, year, my day of education and go to the Tenderloin the street of lost souls in any sizable city's got the street of lost souls and just go walk where they walk and go sit where they sit go talk to them for a while go eat where they eat i got an education like you wouldn't believe now you can't really know what it's like unless you live in the tenderloin but guess what you can do you can try to understand what it might be to live a tragic life not a life of abundance not a life of prosperity not a life like you've got in front of you with this grand opportunity, but a life of tragedy and misery and despair. I'm telling you, you've got to be in touch. You've got to try. Some of the people I met on those occasions, it was unbelievable, the stories I heard. Wow. I met Frank, the bartender. Sleazy little bar. You wouldn't believe this place. Frank sees more tragedy in a week than most people see in a lifetime. And I got to know Frank, neat character. I was there one evening. Frank said, see the lady sitting over there on the bar stool? And I said, yes. He said, how old do you think she is? I said, she's in her 40s. He said, no, she's in her 20s. I thought, whoa. He said, her name is Cookie. He said, Cookie used to be a go-go dancer back in the go-go days. And then she developed this bone disease in her hips and her legs and became crippled. And he said, you know, her go-go days are finished. But he said, Cookie also has a little boy, five years old, and he's dying of leukemia. And he said, Cookie comes and sits here most every night trying to play a little music on the jukebox to cheer herself up. And he said, most evenings she gets so wasted that I have to call a taxi to come and take her home. And I thought, Cookie, how come Cookie, you know, can't make it home without help? I fly around the world. I go everywhere. And Cookie has all these tragic things happening in her life. What happened back there five years ago, ten years ago? What happened when she was a child? You know, I was faced with maybe a crossroad and Cookie went this way and I went this way. What is it that creates such a preponderance of tragedy? Those are good things to ponder. Because here's what it'll do. It'll soften your approach. It'll take the caustic edge off your language. It'll deepen your heart and experience. And your experience will run a lot deeper instead of shallow. 
So here's what I'm asking you to do. Get in touch with all of the aspects of life to the best of your ability. Develop a sensitivity to other people's tragedy. Develop an awareness of the full range from the high to the low, from the admirable to the despicable we mentioned yesterday. And I'm telling you, that kind of experience, that kind of reach on your part, that kind of willingness to let yourself be affected by a broader range than what you might just normally go through in the course of your own personal life, I'm asking you to deepen your experiences in every way you possibly can. It will put some strength, some power, some awareness, some caring, and some depth in your language that I'm telling you, nothing else will supply unless you become a student in this area, a wider range of human experience. So that's the third word, sensitivity. Here's the fourth word, knowledge. To communicate well, you just have to know. You just got to have the information. Here's what's powerful. Power in communication is when what you say is only the tip of the iceberg of all that you know. And then combined with that, the tip of the iceberg of all that you feel. When you speak, and people get the sense, even though you might have only spoke for 10 minutes, that if the occasion called for it, you could talk for 10 hours. You wouldn't run out of illustrations. You wouldn't run out of depth. You wouldn't run out of something you could reach for, an account that's almost inexhaustible. If people get that sense, now you can't on every occasion tell everything you know. Right? The occasion doesn't call for it. But if the people have that sense, if your children have that sense, that what you say is just a piece of all that you feel and all that you know. See, that's what makes communication so powerful. Now, I'm sure all of us have been around some people who very quickly told us more than they knew. I mean, you know, they ran out <laughs> one story and they're done. Don't let that happen to you. Reach for the depths by working knowledge. That's one of the reasons for keeping a journal, to develop the stories, to develop the phrases, to develop the poetry, to develop the sayings, to develop the questions to develop the answers. You know, a book full of knowledge that you refer to constantly and keep refreshing your mind so that when the occasion calls for it, you reach it and it's, and it's there. Okay? When you get ready to talk, here's what you want to happen. You want to be able to have a verbal check that'll cash because you have already put the deposits in your mental bank. See, if you're going to write a check, you previously have to put in the deposits. And I'm saying if you go to work on this now, no matter what the occasion is, even if it's a casual occasion, you'll have something valuable to say. If it's a serious occasion, be no doubt you'll have something valuable to say. But you've got to make these deposits. You've got to have the working knowledge. You've got to have the vocabulary. You've got to have the wisdom, right? You've got to have the storing in your heart and soul and mind, this increasing capacity from which to draw when you get ready to speak. Working knowledge. Don't leave this out. This is laborious. Keeping a journal is laborious. Taking notes is laborious. Paying attention is a bit laborious. But let others drift along being unconcerned with their fingers crossed, hoping their future will work out well, even though they can't communicate well. But not this serious group. Take this serious. Work at this daily. I've done it ever since all of this was awakened for me at age 25. I ask you to do the same for the rest of your life. Be conscious of bits and pieces of information. Be conscious of something more to deposit in your experience bank, in your mental bank your awareness bank, so that when you get ready to draw, it's all there. It's not a shallow account. It's plenteous. Okay, so that's number one, have something good to say. You might want to jot these notes down. I developed a little talk once for service clubs, and here was the title. The four ifs that make life worthwhile. Here's something good to say. Number one, if that makes life worthwhile is if you learn. You've got to learn about life. You've got to learn about people. You don't have much to offer if you haven't learned. Number two, life is worthwhile if you try. You've got to try something with what you've learned. You can read the book, but now you've got to try it. You can get the instructions, but now you've got to put it into action. Life is worthwhile if you try. When the record book on you is finished, let the record book show your wins. Let the record book show your losses. But don't let the record book show you never tried. How would you explain that?
Now, if at first you don't succeed, you try again. I put the bar up two feet and ask the kids who can jump two feet. Some say, I don't know. Some say, no problem. Some say, not me. How are we going to know for sure? Well, you got to try it. You got to back up and take a run at it and see. Now, if you knock the bar down, does that mean you can't jump two feet? And the answer is no. You just got to back up and try it again, try it again. The second time, you may sail over with ease. Come on. You got to keep trying. Here's the next word. Try until. I asked the kids, how long should a baby try to learn how to walk? How long would you give the average baby before you shut it all down? Say, hey, that's enough. No. Any mother in the world would say, what? My baby's going to keep trying on... Until it learns how to walk. I want you to have that same attitude. How many books will you read? Until I get enough information. How many times will you try? Until it happens. Until it starts to show some increase, some benefit, some progress. How many classes will you take? Until I have enough. Until I have an ongoing education that serves me well as an educational support system second to none. That's how long, me, until. I'm asking you to do that. To have magic with your family. How many classes would you take and how many things would you practice to be able to have that? And you say, as many as it takes until. Develop the until attitude. And you cannot be stopped. So life is worthwhile if you learn. Number two, life is worthwhile if you try. Here's number three. Life is worthwhile if you stay. You have to learn to stay. Hang in there. Some people plant in the spring, leave in the summer. Some build a foundation Get weary of that and wander off somewhere else and build another foundation. Guy's got these foundations scattered across the country. No walls, no roof, no finish. I asked a friend of mine once, Jim Cardwell, Phoenix, Arizona. I said, Jim, you know, what are you really good at? He said, starting over. I said, that's my specialty. <laughs> I asked him if he was good at any particular sport. He says, yes, yeah, skating on thin ice. I said, that's my sport. <laughs> Hey, you've got to stay. Hang in there. Who are these people that leave before the game is over? Walking on your shoes and spilling coke down your neck. <laughs> Who are these people? A little less than refined in sophistication. Come on, if you've signed up to see the game, stay till it's over. If you've signed up to play, you have to stay till it's over. Some say, hey, we're too many points behind. We're out of here. No, they'd run you out of town. You'd lose all your decency. You'd lose all of your uh, reputation. Come on, stay till it's over. You don't have to go to every game, but every game you sign up for, stay till it's over. You got to stay through the summer. You got to stay when it's hot. You got to stay when the challenge is on. Now, you don't have to plant every season. Nobody would ask you to do that. But any season you do start it, stay till it's finished. Stay till the cycle is over and see what comes of it. This is true, refined sophistication. Stay. Life is worthwhile if you learn to stay. See it through. Now, here's the last one. Life is worthwhile if you care. The capacity for human caring is limitless, seemingly. It knows no limit. There are no restrictions on human caring. It's, it's the most unbelievable thing to see at work. When the Oklahoma bombing happened, Robin, people, I'm telling you, that you never thought would care, suddenly did care. It became evident. People from all over the country started jumping on airplanes and jumping in automobiles and heading for Oklahoma City. What an outpouring of caring. Some of it kind of submerged for a while. Some of it not on display. But when the occasion called for it, I'm telling you, it was an unbelievable response. And everybody has that capacity. So I'm asking you, life is worthwhile if you care. Now, I wrote this little line. If you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care enough, you'll get incredible results. See if you can't stretch your caring beyond just what's accepted, beyond just what might be expected, beyond what might be average, especially this audience, beyond average. So, point one, step to success, have something good to say. Number two is say it well. First, you've got to have something. Make the mental and emotional deposits. 
Now then you've got to be able to deliver it well. If you've got this bank of knowledge and experience and all of the stuff, but now you've got a faulty delivery system. See, sometimes that's where it loses its appeal or it loses its effectiveness, it loses its dynamics. Doesn't penetrate through, doesn't reach the heart, doesn't reach the soul, doesn't reach the occasion, doesn't solve the problem. It falls too short. Not from lack of spirit and awareness and all of the stuff, mental, bank of preparedness, but now being able, unable to deliver it well. So this is valid, number two, saying it well. And let me give you some keys on saying it well. Here's number one, sincerity. I started with that yesterday morning. Sincerity creates the best climate and atmosphere for something good to happen. If someone sincerely wishes to transmit ideas in a viable manner that's useful, that's hearable, that's understandable, that's, you know, mixed with power, mixed with heart and soul. If somebody is sincere, see, that lays the preparation that nothing else can lay. So sincerity. Here's the next one, repetition. To say it well, you just, you just need practice. I've been practicing all these years. I've been lecturing for the public for almost now 34 years. And each occasion is trying to improve, trying to get better, trying to get better. Because I had the same problems everybody had when I first started. My first public talk, I stood up, my mind sat back down. <laughs> I opened my mouth and nothing came out for a while, right? My knees are banging together, sweat's pouring off my face, shaking like a leaf. It's called terror, <laughs> in case you haven't tried it. But see, I got up and I did it again, and then I did it again, and then I did it again, and I swallowed hard, and I did it again, and finally, finally gained a little more confidence. Yeah, but it takes time. But I'm telling you, anybody can master it, because remember from yesterday, no one lacks the capacity. And if you become too lazy to cash in on the other 90% you haven't used yet, then that's your fault, not the government, not anybody else's. But I'm asking you percentage by percentage, point, just get better, capitalize on 10% of your capacity, and then 20, and then 30, and just keep this graph going up. And you will be startled at the effect that you'll have on your business and your life and the people that you're in touch with, your family, and everything that radiates out from you that comes within the circle of your influence. Practice. Now, next is brevity. Sometime, you know, when you get better, you can be shorter. Sometimes at first, right? It takes a long time to get it said. But when you've developed skills later on, brevity will be powerful. You won't have to say much. Jesus was brief. In putting his team together, he wandered around the countryside. And every once in a while, he'd look at someone and say, you follow me. See, that's short. <laughs> that's no hour sermon. Short. Now, how could he be so brief? Here's the note. He could be brief because of what he was that he didn't have to say. And see, that's the secret we covered yesterday, personal development. That's the secret. For what he was that he didn't have to say, he could be very brief. Didn't take long. Most of his pronouncements were very short. C can be memorized in not too long a period of time. All that he had to say that's ever been recorded. It's not that long. But he could be brief because of what he was, the power that he had of what he was. See, if someone's reputation has preceded them, they probably don't need to say much when they show up. If your reputation gets there before you do, it may not take you long. And that's what you want to build, that kind of reputation that's out there, the kind of person you are, the kind of personality you have, right? The kind of aura, the kind of charisma that you've developed. I'm telling you, it doesn't take many words. If you've got all that other stuff going for you, you can be brief. Next is style. Now, you've got to develop your own style, but here's a good point. Be a student of style. But don't just copy someone. There's about a dozen people that have been close to me over the years. If you knew that dozen people, here's what you would say. A little bit of each of those dozen people shows up in Jim Rohn. Right? He hasn't copied any of them, but sure enough, you can tell he's been influenced by these dozen people. 
by his actions, by his words, by his mannerisms, right? They've influenced him. And I'm asking you, key phrase, let yourself be influenced by people of reputation, skill, power. Not to copy, not to be like another person. Let it develop in you all that is available in terms of capacity. But let yourself be tutored. Let yourself be influenced by a wide range of people that you consider competent in their field, that you consider that have the heart, the soul, the language, the skill, the style. It's important. Because sometimes, you know, the style is important. We could borrow, right? Maybe a little more style from the Italians by being able to make the gestures that sort of back up your words. Frank Sinatra, I'm telling you, a big part of his effect, magical effect on an audience is not just his sound and not just the lyrics, but his style. Nobody does it like Frank Sinatra. Still going at what? I mean, the man's ancient. <laughs> but he's still got what? Style. Yes, he's got sound. Yes, he's got lyrics. Yes, he's got the charisma, but he's also got the style. And it's not overdone. You know, it's, 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 it's Frank Sinatra. You've got to develop your style. Maybe you need to talk a little more with facial expressions. And open up your eyes and let people into the heart of your soul. Right? Maybe you need to be a little more forthcoming, a little more open, not quite so hidden. Right? Come out a little stronger. Not too strong, but a little stronger. So develop good style. Be a student of style. I've tried to study this all my life. People that I admired that affected people well with language and presence and personality. Wow. So be a student here. Now here's the last part, vocabulary. You just got to have a good working vocabulary. I don't know any way around this. You, you just can't mumble your way to a fortune. <laughs> you know, you, you got to have the stuff. You got to have the meaningful words, vocabulary. A useful vocabulary. I went to work on my vocabulary at age 25, and I'm telling you, I found it very useful. Having only gone to one year of college, right, I, I was somewhat lacking in formal education. So I've tried to make up for that all these years. And one is the study of vocabulary. It's another one of the major books to put in your library, and that's the dictionary. Words are fascinating. Some are Spanish origin. Some are German origin. Some are Latin origin. You know, some are obvious of origin. Right? The word halt. I mean, that's not French. It's got to be what? German. So, the study of language, especially your own language, and nothing richer than the English language. So, get you a dictionary. Be a student of vocabulary. Some of my friends took a survey once among prisoners and some rehabilitation program they were looking on. And they weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. Startling information. But once you look at it for a while, it becomes obvious. A relationship between vocabulary and behavior. And here's what they discovered. The more limited the vocabulary, the more tendency to poor behavior. Now, when you just stop and think about it for a while, I'm telling you, it makes sense. Here's why. Number one, vocabulary is a way of seeing. If somebody speaks to you, you can only translate what you see and what you hear and what you feel. You can only translate that to the screen of your own consciousness with your present vocabulary. You cannot interpret what's going on in life and what's being said and what's being done. You can't interpret it any better than your present vocabulary allows you to. Don't we often say with a bit of burden on our heart, how come they can't see it? And maybe this is part of the restriction of to why they can't see it. They don't have an extensive enough vocabulary to see it. It's too limited. What if you could only see the world through this little tiny hole? That's all you had, this little tiny hole to see the world. And somebody said, you know, the world is like this. And you'd say, no, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. The world is like this. You say, no, no. Th that doesn't even begin to describe the world. This, now how come they think it's like this? That's all they can see. And 
and vocabulary either expands or narrows your ability to comprehend, to see the wider range of life's menu, the wider range of possibilities, or the nearness of the dangers. If you can't see, you fall prey. If you can't see, I'm telling you, you are at risk. And not only are you at risk, but you miss the opportunity. If you can't see the opportunity and you can't see the danger, you can imagine the stumbling around all day long that might occur if you just can't see well. So here's what you've got to do. Increase your vocabulary so that you can see better the opportunity. You can see better the how-to. You can see better the nuances. You can see better the little foxes that spoil the vine. You can see better the dangers as well as the full extent of the opportunity that's way out there. Some people can't see what's way out there. Why? They don't have that much scope of vocabulary. So I'm asking you to be interested in the language. Why? Language helps you to interpret what you see and what you hear and what you feel. Now, here's the other side. Only by vocabulary can we express what's going on in our head, in our heart. And if you can't express well the questions, if you can't express well how you're feeling, and if you can't see well the opportunities or the dangers, can you imagine the frustrated life you would probably live? And your life gets to be smaller and smaller because you can't see, you can't see, you can't see. Your life gets smaller and smaller. Finally, you only need a place 10 by 12 to live because your world is not much bigger than that. So I'm asking you, if you want the full expanse of opportunity to strike your consciousness, you've got to have a good vocabulary or you've got to work your vocabulary. Some words you've known and you've forgotten or some words, right, need to be dusted off and utilized. So... The gate of the soul is vocabulary. Words are the open gate or the closed gate. And I'm asking you to have a wide open gate so that the words can reach your consciousness and paint a picture beyond imagination. See, when you're young and your vocabulary is, is small, that's, some of those times are crucial. When you just can't see it, you just can't see it. Adults say, come on, come on. They say, this is all I can see. And that period of time between when their vision is restricted and when finally they can see more of the dangers and the opportunities, I'm telling you, that is called crucial time. One of my stepsons, Bruce and I, are riding our motorcycles on the Jeep trails up at Clear Lake. And it was a beautiful day, and the sun was about to go down. And I'm out in the lead, and, you know, I stopped and taken off my helmet Bruce comes flying up behind. He's about 11 years old, 11, 12. And the sun was just going down. And just before he got there, I'm admiring the sunset and the valley and the mountains behind. It was absolutely breathtaking. And so Bruce comes up. He takes off his helmet and walks up beside me. And I said, Bruce, take a look at this sunset. Isn't this the most magnificent sight you've ever seen in your life? And he said, you know, it's getting a little late. We better get going. <laughs> I thought, wow. How come this magnificent sight doesn't strike him like it strikes me? How come he's not overwhelmed by the beauty of all of this? And then it dawned on me. When you're young, with this palette of colors to paint these pictures on the screen of your mind, you've only got just a few colors. At age 12, 11. And see, as your life unfolds and as your vocabulary increases and your experience increases, now you have many, 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 many more colors on this palette with which to paint these pictures on the screen of your mind. So I'm asking you to practice that. Vocabulary. Practice keen concentration on getting things through the gate of vocabulary so that they reach your consciousness and paint for you opportunity and paint for you danger, how-tos, all of that stuff mainly comes through vision. Vision comes through vocabulary. Now, here's what I used to do. Back in those early days, I would take two or three words I didn't know and put them up on the sun visor of my car. And by the time the day finished, I had mastered two or three more words. And anybody can do that. Three words a day, and at the end of the year, you've got a working vocabulary of another thousand words. And who knows what extra lights that extra thousand words might turn on as you go back and read Shakespeare again and you read the Bible again, and you read the books again, and you read the training classes again, now you're able to see some things you couldn't see before. Do not restrict your sight.
keep working on your ability to see.